Hey, hey, good people. Welcome to Over the Horizon. Uh, man, it's been, a, it's been a really, really crazy past few months with, um, of, obviously, with everything else going on in the world. But um, we're seeing so much happen in the field of AI and, and change so much of our lives that it's really, I think, for the average person like me, it's kind of impossible to get a sense of just how far reaching these developments are, just how far reaching the implications are. Um, and then just this past week, there's been so much that's been happening um, on the AI development front. Um, and this is this is the benign side of AI, might I tell you. I mean, we've seen a lot of AI playing a very, very uh, important and deep role um, in the war in Ukraine. Um, but that's that's not something that we're going to deal with at this at this moment in time and in this episode in this episode of o, of OTH over the rise and I want to talk about um you know AI like Dali and Midjourney um and we've all seen what's happening with uh, with Meta and they came out um with their crazy videos that they you could just put in a few words and then you know just the AI does everything for you and it was it was just crazy and I I I'm yeah. not an expert, so I thought I'd get an expert, and uh, <laughs> I'd like to introduce you now to Guy Parsons, who's um, just this brilliant guy who's been working a lot uh, with Dali, and then Dali too, if I'm not mistaken. You're one of the first creator, uh, first creators given access to Dali, isn't that, Guy? With with Dali too, yeah, I was lucky enough with to Dali be too. part of the uh, part of the uh, test. Uh, right, through. right. And, and just how early was uh, were, were you given access to Dali Two? Oh, I mean, it felt like a long time after it was first revealed, only because it was so frustrating and exciting to see <laughs> other people starting to post their content. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe it was like uh, like four weeks, uh, some sometime around that. I um, I wrote to them asking to, <laughs> to, I said, I have to participate. I have to try this out. And like, mm -hmm. I want to create some amazing content about it. So uh, and they were kind, kind enough to invite me to, to give it a go. Of course, just yesterday, they finally um, stopped the wait list. And now it's uh, now instant access for everyone. That's how quickly it's all moving. So yeah. OK, so let's let's just um, let's kind of show um, people what Dali 2 is and what it is that we're talking about. Just do do the honors and take us through this. this I've just pulled up the, the Dali website and just give us a brief understanding for those who are not clued in on what's really happening. Just help us understand what, what Dali 2 is and what this AI uh, and this technology means. Uh, that's a big question. Well, in the simplest terms, the thing that everyone knows it from is um, it's a text to image. AI, okay. which simply right. means that it turns strings of text like a cat on a skateboard um, into a picture and it creates that picture completely originally from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's randomized, so it's different every time um, every time someone enters it in. Um, mm -hmm. It's been trained on hundreds of millions of images. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually based on the original technology, which was designed to turn images. Have you ever seen a polar bear playing bass mm -hmm. or a robot painted like a Picasso? And, uh, is it? Yeah. So it was originally based on, uh, it's based on partly on this tool called Clip, which was designed to turn images into text. So mm -hmm. it was a tool to just generate um, captions. So you could, you know, show a photo and say, you know, what's this of? And it would be like, oh, it looks like a sunset over the mountains. Um, and then the kind of innovation or the, the leap forward was was how do you then throw that algorithm into reverse um, and turn um, the caption into an image. Um, and then interestingly, I think you, I just heard you mention Midjourney. Um, yeah. Uh, over that, the, the clip, which was the image to text um, AI, um, mm -hmm. was actually something that OpenAI, who were the creators of DALI, uh, kind of released and open sourced um, to other to people, to other researchers, and other researchers have also managed to therefore kind of make uh, very similar uh, leaps forward. So mm -hmm. uh, when Dali came out in uh, Dali Two was released in 
in spring 2022 just this year mm -hmm. um it really seemed like a um, what you call you know state of the art very far ahead of anything um that had been seen before mm -hmm. um and if you on if you're a social media person at the time you might have seen something else uh some other images from a tool called um dali mini which were super <laughs> weird and blurry you and know what of, it's it's yeah. so dude it's so straight it, it's <laughs> I'll tell you what, my, my nine-year-old daughter just blew my mind a few days back. Yeah. And because you spoke of Dali Mini. Okay, so she was yeah. she was playing with her friends on a tab and they were, you know, maybe these these kids have just taken to the whole remote work and uh, you know, the whole workflow, just just like fish to water. Yeah. And it's it she was she was like, look, Papa, this is what I've made. And I was hang on, let me just pull it up in the stream. Yeah. And even this, this is got <laughs> this is Dali yeah. Mini. And I was like, yeah. what are you doing with this? What, what is this? And she said, oh, this is Dali Mini. And I was yeah. like, how did you know about it? She's like, oh, my friends and I have been playing around with this. Nine-year-old kids today. Yeah. As I feel like a see... fossil, man. I feel like a fossil. <laughs> <laughs> so this is obviously, as we're looking at this picture here, is, uh, it was rather, you know, further behind. But just in the last, yeah, in the sure. last few months over this summer, you've yeah. now seen these other, other tools that work mm -hmm. kind of a, a similar way um yeah become much more widely available so yeah. far from and this, even this even this tool yeah. itself i mean you look at this first this is supposed to be harry potter and elsa having yeah. a tea party yeah. right but this it, it didn't it didn't make do such a good a good job of rendering yeah. it yeah. but this is a lot better this is a, a blue fox and a rainbow and yeah, it seems yeah. to be the i mean is it it kind of even i would imagine dali many wouldn't be as advanced obviously as Dali from OpenAI, Dali two, yeah. Um, but it's it's amazing to see the rate of progression in this technology. Mm. Does that scare you? I think I mean, that, it, it, it does. It has I mean, me worried a bit. I'll be honest. The interesting, so like the very interesting player in this game that I think wasn't like necessarily predicted because OpenAI, who invented Dali two. Um, is quite a well kind of famous and well resourced uh, research organization. If it, Elon Musk, I think, was one of the original founders. They have like a billion dollars from Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. but um, he did leave I, later. He did exit. He did, later. Yeah, he's for, yeah, he's well no longer involved, which I think. Is, yeah, um, I'm, I'm a fan of dramatic. Elon, but having said that, you know, it's just I'm just a bit skeptical of 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 yeah. technology that doesn't have any sort of oversight and i think that's my problem i don't yeah. i'm not comfortable with something that doesn't have oversight yeah well that takes us to the point so that uh, dali 2 was you know released and it was um but on it it was quite carefully controlled and they only released it to a few thousand people at a time mm -hmm. um and there's lots of uh, sort of limitations and what you can and can't use it for um mm -hmm. And then just, you know, a couple of months ago, really, um, this other organization called Stability AI, um, which was much lower profile, has much less backing and much less known of, um, mm -hmm. released their equivalent called Stable Diffusion. Right. Um, which isn't just, you know, kind of arguably as good. Um, but they've released that code open mm -hmm. source. So now yeah. anyone can use it. There's no control over it. People can, you, if your computer is fast enough, you can run it locally. You don't need to run mm -hmm. it online or anyone else's server. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really interesting. And that's also moved, and I think will continue to move the progression of these tools forward um, a lot faster because other companies can now incorporate this kind of AI into their product mm -hmm. without inventing it themselves. So yeah, yeah. In, in, in simple tools like Canva and uh, in Figma and things like that, you're starting to see mm. this technology appear already. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, this, the, the, the Figma that's, that cost uh, Adobe $20 billion. Yeah. Yeah. There's, mm. Look, there's big money in this. There's no doubt about that. But I, yeah. I just, I wonder if this is a friend or four of human creative expression and I, and I think, you know, the, my, my, that incident with when my daughter came up and said, look, this is it. And I was like, these are kids playing around yeah. with, with, and I mean, make no mistake, it is an advanced AI, advanced enough to generate 
a picture from a few words of prompt, a few yeah. words of text. So it is advanced enough. And then I guess it's a, it depends on you know how advanced it, you know computing power allows it to be over time. But is this? Is is this uh, is this sort of technology a friend or foe of human creativity? I don't know. Um, do think? I think that's a million dollar question. I think <laughs> it's ultimately in the short term. I think it's a friend because it unlocks. I think of I think of like visual. I speak as someone that's not an artist, so. Mm -hmm. To me, it's like uh, Google Translate in the sense that that let Google Translate helps you speak or understand a new language. And mm -hmm. I, th I think I believe that visual communication, artistic communication is a language and it's one that we all understand, but most of us can't mm -hmm. speak. And this kind of gives, um, it kind of separates like the idea having part of creativity from like the craft from the like making it so now mm. people with the ideas can start to make things even if they don't have like the aptitude the like craft aptitude i mean mm. that's kind of this image kind of scares me um <laughs> so to that extent it's it reminds me of um yeah so to that extent it unlocks a lot of potential new things uh -huh. in the longer term if we're still here to enjoy the longer term, um, <laughs> then um, then obviously there are these kind of, you could imagine a more cynical, does it somehow cause our creativity to wither or what point will kind of learning to create images from scratch have if, if you know if we if, if we're just so used to being able to manifest anything with mm. a few words um yeah. so that's a little hard to predict um at the same time there is always going to be a value i think placed on things that are made um by humans like who have something to say like the knowledge that a real artist or a real um a particular kind of labor has gone into something is one of the things that one of the attributes that sometimes makes art or creativity resonate uh, and i think it will be interesting to see um where that becomes decisive and where it doesn't well, let me let me just pull up uh gallery gallery this is yours right tell us a bit about yeah. this and then we'll get into a bit more about um the value of human creativity mm -hmm. and human labor because wow. i mean it just it just look at look at some of the best art some of the most inspiring impactful art that's been created by by humans over the past many centuries um whether it's paintings or whether it's um architecture or whether it's sculpture i mean there's so much of so much of training so much of 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 just man hours and repetitive work and and just you know muscle memory involved in the building blocks of what comes out finally as art and then you know it's it's this it raises some imp i mean it just it just gets me thinking what happens to all of that training and all of that rigor and all of you know all the many years that you have to put into to get to a certain level when um i just i, I let me just scroll through this I mean, I just I just look at this, and this is all created by AI. And hopefully, you'll take us through it. But this everything yeah. from animations to art, watercolors and impressionists, and you know, even styles of individual artists like yeah, Van, well, that Van Gogh. Is, and, that's very controversial because, um, to some extent, it can also and I'm, and new tools have also been released, but mm. um, it can, you know, some some of these tools can in some circumstances. Um, uh generate kind of work in the style of like living and working artists which is obviously quite unpopular <laughs> for obvious reasons with those artists or at least some of those artists yeah um and a new tool called uh textual inversion kind of lets you upload a set of images um and then create infinite future images based on the style of those originals so it does kind of potentially create um 
yeah some ethical dilemmas I think and also some kind of economic dilemmas <laughs> Um, for, uh, I mean, for sure. I mean, it, what happens to the value of art when an AI can just create something in a few seconds that's as good as, um, if not better in some ways, than the work of, I would say, a good number of artists that are around today. Certainly, and this is from everything from art to photography to the applications in. Uh, in architecture and in other creative fields, what does it do to the value of of human labor? What does it do to the value of of art? I think that the art art contain art is such a broad term because it art contains everything it's, from like it's, yeah the pattern you know on like. Uh, you know the little the little flowery pattern on the deodorant can I can see over there. To you know a painting in a museum. To mm. the thumbnail that appears at the top of an article. To right. You know everything from everything from kind of the most pedestrian decorative pattern to the most kind of conceptual. Look at this piece of um, of art. And if you think about how we you know, can consume it, we look for different things. So the pattern on, you know, uh, a cushion, it might not matter to us whether a human did that or whether an AI did that. Whereas... Yeah, for sure. I think I think so much of 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 um, creativity in different fields is already automated. Yeah. So in a way it's kind of reduce the value of it but that's that's what happens with automation and and mass production and production at scale yeah so like i i suppose that that's quite that is a good analogy in the sense that being able to like manually do stuff by mm-hmm. hand like retains its value but that value is not always like required so you know to be able to like hand carve furniture is still a job and people will actually spend a lot of money on having like bespoke things made, but it's seen as more of a luxury thing hmm. because we, a lot of us are quite happy to get our furniture flat pack from Ikea. Hmm. And we might not, yeah. have, we might not have the taste or the, the, the money to appreciate the difference, but some people will, but obviously at one point, everything was made by hand. So that has changed. Yeah, for sure. The, the economics around, um, the creation and distribution of art in various aspects of our lives and in consumerism, um, production at scale, manufacturing scale, distribution, uh, marketing, and all of that has really played into it. But I mean, is is this kind of, I guess, is this an addition to the human toolkit, creative toolkit, or does it just replace a large chunk or the entire toolkit altogether? I mean, just just look at your your phones, and I mean, your phone, your average phone today, just has everything from a calculator to a calendar to email to mm. a torch to everything in it. And this is what about sixty or seventy devices has just gone out the window because of your device, of your mobile yeah. device. Is this is this going to do that to the creative toolkit? I think it's gonna. Uh, I mean, I think if you think about like photography. Hmm. We can all take pretty good <laughs> photos now, right? Like, and we definitely there's a lot. Thanks more to the technology, it, and that's I, I have to say it's not not necessarily a reflection of individual ability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, and you know, and we all take more photos, and we have tools like Instagram where we share them. I think actually, interestingly, we don't spend that much more time like looking back at old photos. Like, you have a little, I don't know, a little look now and then, but we spend a lot of time. If we're somewhere going, oh, that's nice. Um, but at the same time, most of those photos before this tool were not, just didn't exist, right? Like it hasn't replaced photo- mm. photographers. It might have replaced some photography. Like, you know, I, when you have to get a passport now, like I don't go to the little machine because you can just, you know, when you need your photo yeah. ID, you might have to for use sure. the little booth. Um, but for, in, and you know, for your important days, your wedding or whatever, you know, you still get a professional in. 
Mm. Um, it's just there's a lot more photos of like an average Wednesday because you can take it yourself. So I think in the similar way. So there's still today, a human. There's still a human being at at the average wedding, um, yeah. doing the photography. I, I just wonder, man. You've got we're a few hours away from um, from AI Day Two, Tesla's AI Day Two, and I'm just I can't help but wonder. Is there is 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 the Optimus bot going to be doing what maybe ten photographers would at a what at a, at a oh. wedding? <laughs> a robot photographer that would be something. Yeah. Well, we'll have to wait and see what's announced. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, sorry. Go back to what um, you're saying. No. So yeah, I think you know any technology is always going to probably replace something but it's mm -hmm. more but it's as exciting to think about what are all the new things that are going to happen that just didn't happen before um and then what effect will that have because another like a slightly interesting uh, there's a second piece of the puzzle which is to do with um do we like to do with the production of images and like the consumption of them so mm -hmm. there's this kind of exciting or dramatic change in how images are produced but will it necessarily cause a change in like how images are consumed like will it create new i don't know i'm trying to think of a good example here well um, i've pulled up your gallery gallery website and let's just I, I guess i guess my point is that like i'm i'm obviously super i'm super fascinated Mm -hmm. by this um technology so at the moment on twitter or reddit or whatever i spend a lot of time looking at the things that these are that can be made by it but it's still the case that for the average person right we don't spend it's not like an it's not like a main form of entertainment right we don't all spend like an hour every evening like looking at pictures on social media like we like we don't like Really? So just because, <laughs> well, well, maybe, but like we look at like photos of like what our friends did or like real things. Um, I thought everybody but, was Instagram obsessed or TikTok obsessed. Well, yeah, but like, but those are like different kinds of, do you know what I mean? Just because you can generate, just because we can generate these images, it's yeah. not yet clear like how, if, how, and even if they will like really be consumed because it's all, or, or like, I think it, not to say that they won't be, but like, what would that look like? What because would it look like? Not, yeah, I don't know. Maybe like, are we going to use... Your take? <laughs> I don't know. It's like the TikTok thing, isn't it? That could have been invented sort of at any time. But now it's like become like... The, so the... so are, you are you saying TikTok, um, there may have been precursors to TikTok. But they didn't like become design. TikTok because the time wasn't right. Yeah, or the technology wasn't quite there, or you kind of have to see how other people, you know, like the the like the notion of having like a dance craze, like a sort like or everyone suddenly like lip syncing to things mm. going viral is like mm. a new idea that that app mm. has made possible. But, and yeah, yeah, that 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 just <laughs> I don't know if that that um, that's a good. It just gets me thinking, man. I mean, just are we, are we, have we been herded enough for this sort of technology to really, you know, take root and really spread like wildfire? Is this is this herd mentality something that's you know copying each other and and kind of mm -hmm. feeling left out if you're not part of that that um, the latest trend or something? Is that is that kind of playing into this? I think so, but it, I mean that's uh, the creator of Mid Journey uh, had was interviewed in a uh, for a website. Um, I think it was The Verge, and he actually made an interesting point, which was because Mid Journey you can only use via this chat app called Discord, um, and originally right. you can I and mean, originally, or at least if you try it for free, you try it. It's like a bot, like in it's Discord's like Slack, if you haven't, if you use that, but not Discord. Um, so you would try yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. In, this, in this public uh, chat room. And he, and I find that quite annoying uh, or like not, it's not super user friendly, I suppose. But he was making the point that 
they kind of found that if you told someone they invented this tool, um, mm. then you'd be like, oh, you can draw anything. And they would type in like, Dog. this is this is daily mid journey, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, and then they would be like, no, no, like literally anything. And they would go, oh, okay. Like pink dog. And then they would get bored and walk off. But it's only by seeing what everyone else was doing and kind of copying and like, yeah, that's putting your own twist on it. That it's inherently, it's, it is kind of a social, it's a method of communication. So you need to, you want to see, you know, you, yeah, you learn I'm, language socially. Yeah. And, and you learn so much by imitating others. Um, yeah. But it kind of, then again, it kind of gets me thinking, you know, what about what happens to individual creativities? Does everybody, and it's like, I mean, you know, something like Dali 2 would kind of bring, I guess, everybody who has access to Dali 2, bring them at um, more or less the same starting point or the starting level. The only difference is that starting level is now so advanced and so, yeah. well, <laughs> it's like you just wouldn't be a bad artist anymore. Yeah. I, in terms of... Um... Becoming a beginner at doing stuff by by uh, yeah, you prob we're probably beginning now at a stage where a regular artist uh, has kind of gone through at least a few years, maybe more, to get there. All the hard yeah. work, all the training, all the time spent is just out the window, and yeah. everybody gets to start. Um, so then, what what's the differentiating factor then? Is it is it so, and I guess that's also that kind of plays into what creativity really is. Is it because you've got to kind of conceive it in your mind before you put it down onto a medium, right? Mm. And the ability to do a good job of it depends on your skill and your training. Yeah. But if you take those two out the window, what is it? I mean, what's the differentiating factor then? Is it just how well you can describe your prompt? <laughs> Is that um, it? Does it boil down to that? I think sometimes it will, right? Like some of like what makes it's like what makes some things go viral, I guess. And it's like if you think about like what makes content like when it is shareable. Sometimes it's just like a, like almost like a joke, like a funny, like the idea is good. Like for some reason, the idea is amusing. Um, in which case now, yeah, but it's... like any, anyone can have that idea um, and you don't have to worry about executing it. So for those kinds of things, yes, I think what we might see is, uh, but you already see on the internet kind of on, is like the kind of content you see is where the fact that a human has done it is part of the uh, the appeal so mm -hmm. i'm trying to think of exactly like you it's often like a video and someone you know when someone makes those like <laughs> the dominoes and they're like all falling over and it's like this huge pattern or you know there's some kind of uh those uh, rube goldberg machines or you know an enormous kind of sculpture and i think you know in create i mean it's inevitable to me that this will change our view of like what is and isn't interesting and impressive to look at if only because there's so much there could potentially be so much like ai Does generated it... work that in order yeah. to stand out a new kind of aesthetic will emerge so how do you stand like... out how do you I innovate think... how do you <laughs> what, what 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 happens to individuality well, how does individuality manifest itself? What do you think is the differentiating factor? What's the secret sauce? Okay. I'll shut up. <laughs> what is the secret sauce of individuality? I think it would depend on what the um, like aesthetics, uh, social aesthetics are always changing. Like what is considered, you know, like it's like fashion, like what is considered cutting edge becomes mainstream and then it becomes tired and a bit passe and similarly I think we'll see like big companies like for example not that they are the most interesting entity I don't want to be too capitalist about it mm. um but 
you know like a luxury brand or like you know they want to they want their website or their what their brand their world to look better than the average yeah. company so if every company can you create <laughs> uh, visuals with ai then they're gonna have to ask themselves what can we create that ai can't? that is different and, yeah that and is... that might be to do with video i mean although we're already seeing ai video things it might be to do with like physical objects and it might maybe they were going to have statues and i don't know what they're going to do but there will be like a reaction and then like a, a counter reaction um but how quickly ai can kind of uh, yeah move in, in response i mean it seems like it's moving pretty fast to me hmm. <laughs> yeah interesting but okay so a lot of a lot of what comes out or is chucked out or is it kind of spat out by the ai um, based upon the prompt that you put in um mm. is what it can it is what it puts together uh, based upon what it's been taught really to put it in simplistic yeah. terms so yeah. the data that's used to train the ai is its point of reference yes right and mm. and that point of reference has um for for the human to interact with the ai um the medium is words and those words go into a prompt and so if you say um harry potter on mars um the connection between who harry potter is and looks like and what mars is and looks like has already been fed into into the the building blocks of the data that the ai has been trained on Correct. so what i guess what i'm trying to say is that it kind of you you presuppose that you're working with with stuff that already exists you can't invent yes. stuff no well <laughs> um that is changing might already be less true so i'll really? give you a couple of examples well obviously the most the, the most obvious thing to type in and which is a bit crazy enough on its own right is kind of what you what you suggest so um an impressionist painting of harry potter right. um or um a marble statue of um a fox uh a fox on rainbow um mm -hmm. yeah, so those are just, what you might call like normal yeah let's just let's just deal with foxes for the moment fox on um, a rainbow so there you even go. understanding all those terms and all those things hmm. it can um uh, it, it can do is is already quite exciting quite a big job but may, maybe it does play into what you sure. said about is originality I mean, possible but 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 at the at the at the, uh, at the at the very heart of it in the impressionist style is quantified already for the ai right what a fox so is then, is already quantified yeah so then you found you know then there's a kind of second level to it which is people have started to investigate even just using text like what happens if you like combine artists or like um or give it a prompt that doesn't make sense like um uh, a photograph by van gogh so then it's like how is it making sense of these kind of how is it combining these like visual ideas and potentially mm -hmm. by doing that you're kind of trick tricking <laughs> into creating something that genuinely is you know not quite like anything you've seen before Right. Uh, and obviously scratching the surface of all those different terms and thematic ideas from the history of known visual things um you could you, you know people are only just discovering how those might be combined and, and what effects might be happening um and then you've got um I, and i mean this is again this is something that maybe people thought was further away um but it kind of seems to be here already which is that there's these tools that now rather than prompt only with text you can take a photo of an object or you can 
upload a series of images, let's say that you yourself have created that are, you know, whatever you want to say, like truly um, uh, innovative or, or, or whatever, and use those as the, the, the fuel or the trigger to create something based off of that. So that does let, that creates another way to bring in something that is kind of truly, um, uh, that is something beyond language or that you wouldn't otherwise be able to, to, to describe. Mm. Another yeah, thing with that uh, is uh, yeah. uh, characters, I guess. Yeah, which is um, another kind of one of the current shortcomings is like getting it, getting these tools to kind of understand what should and shouldn't change about like a concept. So mm -hmm. that is again why you see a lot of Harry Potter and Homer Simpson and the Muppets because. Yeah, it's kind of, I, I don't know, man. I just, it just feels like we're dumbing down even further and we're just getting more alike and individuality is under threat. Because mm. if if a starting point to creativity using AI is what already exists, um, and yeah, you're kind of interpreting that in your own way to bring out your individuality, your or your individual idea or concept or play on it. You just your starting point is still pretty much a level playing field, and everybody can start off. So I don't I don't know how. I mean, I I just I guess I'm a bit skeptical of what this does for um the human creative spirit oh well, i think i actually think you have found the positive rather than the negative <laughs> <laughs> well because you can't because i think it's like the crit you, i think this tends to get criticized from both sides and like only one can be true so like ultimately you know if if i if we accept the premise or of of your criticism, which is that you know it's hard. You can't create things that are truly that original with it, and it's limited to this kind of pre-existing palette, training set of ideas. Mm. Then I get that's kind of bad. That makes the AI limited, but then that obviously just creates more space for humans to be creative without these tools. So do, do you know what I mean? The fact that these tools have like a weakness. I think is as yeah, but, positive as it is negative. So hang on. So do you mean weakness as, as a function of computing power and computing power is a limiting factor here? Is that what you're saying? No, no well you your I guess what you what your point that creativity, like if if you if your feeling is that creativity with this is, is limited because it's limited by, you know, for instance, what you can describe in a sentence or the middle the images that it's been trained on um mm. which is obviously uh uh not every possible image then you know i think that's fine because that means the things that can't be <laughs> there's still a whole thing out there of creating other kinds of art that, that ai can't do i think to some at extent, the moment for now yeah for now for now, for now. so like <laughs> yeah 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 you know what scares me the most what's that Moore's law. Yeah. It We've just kind of puts few, everything to, into pers perspective. Yeah. I mean, if, look, I mean, if, if, and, and um, I was just watching the, I think the um, NVIDIA AI um, announcements and demonstrations um, it was about a week or 10 days back. And it was amazing how the AI was then, the AI models were, and were also now, working on music, creating into, uh, mm. uh, creating new music and stuff. So I don't know, It's it's it kind of seems that it's a function of computing power. And from the yeah. shift from CPUs to GPUs and parallel computing to now parallel computing on steroids, it's just, and it just doesn't stop, it just seems to be every, every eight months, it's just another barrier broken. And, you know, it's just that yeah. the AI has, can kind of crunch so much more of data and then you know learn so much better and you're seeing it develop in in fields of computer vision you're seeing fields of robotics to de develop at the same time um it just it kind of it, it it's a bit of a scary scary prospect <laughs> i suppose i de it definitely <laughs> is yeah i think I think even the people that work in the industry are aware of um, the 
some of the contradictions and impacts that the work could have. I don't think they're going to like stop because it's their yeah. Job. I mean, we yeah. I mean, let's not forget what happened with the um, the Google bot, um, supposedly sentient Google bot. Oh yeah, uh, sure. yeah, and and the whole the whole debate around the Turing test, and then we'll come to that a bit later. But I, mm-hmm. I just you know bias that's baked into um, the the AI algorithm is is yeah. I think such a big issue. And uh, you know, a few days back, I was talking to this really um, brilliant young uh, Egyptian architect who grew up in Alexandria and in Egypt and is now in California. And we were talking about, um, he was telling me how he was trying to to kind of bring in concepts that, you know, impressed him growing up in Egypt and in terms of Islamic architecture and Egyptian architecture and what he saw around yeah. him. Let me, let me just quickly pull up... Um, there we go. All right. So this is uh, this is his Instagram page, and this is Cairo Sketches, and okay. he was using this. Uh, he was using a description of what his um, what what the essence of of his memories in terms of Egyptian art and and Islamic art and architecture and the influences of that into. And he's mm. he, he was he's he works with Mid Journey, so yeah. Um, you know, in, in trying to get architectural concepts. And he was telling me that it was so difficult for the AI to deliver what he wanted when it came to Islamic art and architecture. And yeah. I suppose that's a function of the training data of an AI. And that is so important because it it, it kind of just raises so many questions about inherent biases and in these technologies that are, that are mm. being developed and are just going to impact our, our lives in such profound I, ways i'm yeah i just, that i'm it kind of it does go back a little bit to your, your previous point so there's a, a bit of a interesting um there's a few interesting things that are happening there i mean so number one is these images these <laughs> number one is that uh, primarily these companies aren't talking about this set of images they're trained on um so it remains mysterious but you can understand that they're probably using western um image sets you know i'm in the uk i'm in northern europe i'm thinking of shutterstock and getty and um a kind of these kinds of so even though it's hundreds of millions of images they're kind of north american you know in flavor probably uh, with all the kind of inherent um uh somewhat biases that that those come with um but then with mid journey um uh, it's but mid journey is an interesting example because they then tune the model um based on like the images how like how um visually appealing the source images are so they kind of work out you know out of 10 it shows you know and stable diffusion works the same way basically what i'm saying it's not just like here's 500 million photos they're also teaching the ai which out of those photos which ones are considered like good and like nice to look at and which ones are not Hmm. but obviously so there is a feedback loop there is a feedback loop and and the ai is constantly learning it's interesting it you got... say that because sorry, I just I just it's interesting yeah. you say that because you know he he said the same thing and he he's like you know he was Hassan Ragab is by the way and I'll put a link to his Instagram page um, below this um, yeah and you can you know reach out to him comment but he was telling me you know he's 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 now trying to get more and more artists and architects and creators from his part of the world in the Middle East to just get onto these training models and just and use them and then yeah kind of force uh, or kind of influence the feedback loop um, yeah. in just the same way you were talking about. Um, so Midjourney kind of put out another update. They cha- they kind of improve the model um, as time goes by. And one of the more recent ones, they said, oh, people thought we must have shown it, like taught it loads more paintings, but we didn't. We just biased it more towards the kind of images that people were upvoting and engaging and liking with. Mm-hmm. So 
number one that's kind of problematic on a creative level because like let's say you want to create images <laughs> that yeah. are for whatever reason unpopular like you're an artist mm. like you're an artist you don't care about being liked you want to do something brand new right but the model is now tweaked to match what the average mid journey user likes so mm -hmm. that's kind of limiting in itself second of all of course the average mid journey user is not the average person in fact nobody's the average person um, so, you know, again, if they're mostly, you know, middle class white people from, um, you know, the East Coast of America, right. that's, that's a different set. Like they've taught, they've said, oh, this image is good and this is bad. But the question is, like, according to who? Um, yeah. However, the interesting workaround in the long term that you can imagine is what if there were different models? Like if I was a big company, like big commercial company, I would tweak right what that what those signals were based on like if you're a user in egypt <laughs> the images the rating of images would be different to you know what the average user in in shanghai might have have considered you know aesthetically pleasing so you might having kind of smaller localized things or maybe you're in egypt but you want to go and use the one in shanghai because you're kind of yeah like, exactly i mean because it. yeah wouldn't that kind of limit creativity to to regional yeah. boundaries or eventually you can teach it what you consider good and then it starts tweaking to you uh, is that you personally rather than your your um <laughs> location or, i guess or i feel that. a lot better now that it's it's it, <laughs> it's still not there yeah it's still I not there. It, it still can't make the deep fakes across the world that we're we're so afraid of. It still can't do the sort of stuff that could really yeah. damage. Um, I mean, the already damaged social media and our yeah. our various forms of modern human and social interaction. Yeah, I'm not so uh, I'm not so concerned by those things, which might be naive, but I just think if you look at the news and the impact that social media has had in some ways over the last decade, I don't think you need AI generated images <laughs> to create, create social discord and mistrust. Um, uh, I mean, well, you never know. Help. Yeah, you never I mean, know. Maybe I mean people would fake news is such a big thing stuff. already. Yeah. I mean, imagine what you can do with um, fake news on AI steroids. Yeah. It's a bit yeah. scary, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. So I mean, how do we how do we deal with the issue of oversight and who polices AI? Mm. And the greater good well, of who ensures the greater good of so human society. I guess you could start off with what is the greater good of human society. It would differ from time to time and place to place. But in, in a generic um manner of speaking um is it something like open ai is it government or is it collective to begin with what is it i think we're gonna it's difficult to i mean because i think it, the thinking has changed very quickly i think mostly as a result of stable diffusion right but because before ai has been seen as the province of the product of like large corporations. I think we've been using the social media model where, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is kind of seen as accountable in some way or like vilified mm. to an extent, rightly or wrongly, for the bad things that happen on, say, on Facebook and Instagram. Um, yeah, he had to go on to Joe Rogan and spend three hours explaining himself. Yeah. Whereas, and so with that, when like Dali 2 came out, for instance, that kind of initially had a similar resonance because it was created by this big company in San Francisco that was a bit mysterious and they mm. ran it on their server so they could kind of control who used it and who didn't but that also kind of meant if people misused it then they should know and they were moderating it now you have this new tool that no one owns they're not even selling it it's just yeah. open source yeah. that anyone can run on their own computer and they're just like well you know not awful. Uh, yeah, so, but then where the, the, the users who are using it are the product, aren't they? They're they're interacting and teaching the AI. Yeah. 
Well, they then, you know, then it becomes more of an ethic of it's like the, but you know, the analogy some people use of like Photoshop, like Adobe. Yeah. Yeah. If you create a mean image of someone in Photoshop, no one yeah. goes to blame Adobe for doing it. They blame the creator. So it's a, a movement of, um, yeah, responsibility, I guess, to the end user. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could um, have, just have someone. I mean, um, you could just have someone create a picture of Zelensky, um, I don't know, shaking hands with Putin, and that could just <laughs> fox yeah. so many people around the world. It could just be such a good fake. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, of course, in the, I mean, I think the more scary thing will probably be outside of these tools but when like ai is started to use to kind of essentially do kind of knowledge work so already you're seeing ai that you can teach to use google and excel and do kind of research and potentially you start and then it will become like a Almost like yeah, like a like you know. Yeah, I mean, you already have bots writing news articles, yeah. where it's re where it's repetitive. The format is repetitive, um, and then it's 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 so much easier to then apply a bot to that process, yeah, and do away with human labor. But then that just then extends to, um, if you look at the advancements in computer vision, and um, let's say not just Google AI that's looking at the world, but also Tesla, which is by far, I think, the most advanced computer vision program in, in, in AI. Mm -hmm. And we're now talking about, um, just the other day, I was listening to the Stanford um, head of robotics, um, and she was saying that they're, um, they've, they've been doing, um, a, a, they've been studying um, what humans would like to outsourced to a robot and they came and they were like they've they've now found at least a thousand um different things in your everyday life that an average human being would be happy with outsourcing to a robot things like um cleaning the toilet or packing sure. your kids lunch packing your kids lunch or mowing the lawn but strangely enough humans still want to open their christmas presents Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not, that, oh, what a chore. Get the robot to do it. Where's the fun in that? Yeah, exactly. But I mean, just think about it. It's, um, it's all of, none of this is in the realm of science fiction anymore. It's no. very much an intrinsic part of academic research with direct and Im almost immediate applications in real world AI. And just yeah. the, the rate at which this is developing and growing, it's not even exponential. It's just, I, I feel it's logarithmic. It's just, mm. it is so steep. Yeah, it is so steep really that far. it's stunning. It's stunning. And that's, I think, I don't see, coming back to the point of oversight, I don't see any sort of a framework um, that I feel is sufficient enough to, monitor whether it's crowd-based or open source or or even by any government i think we've got so much of catching up to do don't you think yeah i think that ai is too broad like ai like obviously the, the discoveries and the like developments that are happening in different fields or different applications are connected. There's certain kinds of um, insights into things like transformer models and, you know, using GPUs and stuff what, that apply to lots of different things. But yeah. the government does not really regulate. It's like saying who regulates, um, you know, electricity. I mean, there's there's like there's regulation of like power stations and electricity companies, and then there's, but they don't, they're not concerned with like, you know, toasters or your the, the appliances in your house. That's like regulated by like a different set of things. Yeah. So you know the kind of laws and 
or whatever things around you know image generation are going to be very different from self-driving cars which in turn are going to have different impacts than tools that start to become competitive for like entry level knowledge work jobs um i do think it's going to be interesting i think one of the interesting but scary kind of commercial uh impacts i think one of the things that's interesting about dali right dali 2 and so on is before that i feel like a lot of people have focused on using ai in quite mission critical environments like driving a car or uh, or things that are quite controversial like approving people for loans um and these kind of like dynamics where people have been very like cautious about employing them even in i mean stakes. but yeah but at the same time i mean if you look at the medical field i think it's ai has already um very easily surpassed human ability to read an x-ray yeah yeah and that is acceptable today Mm. the fact that um when you apply for a job there's probably a bot that's going through thousands of applications and that is acceptable today yeah and that's that is a very direct uh, impact on whether or not person a gets the job or person b gets the job yeah true and it's already impacting lives and i don't think people kind of realize it and mm. you were talking about low level knowledge jobs but I mean how how many cab drivers do you think there are in the world today? A few million. I wouldn't care to guess. Yeah, millions obviously of course, yeah. Now, what if Tesla's um robot taxi network just comes up by let's say in 2 years from now. What happens to all those jobs? Mm. They're out of the window. Yeah. And that's so then, yeah again another So what's their safety net? yeah what happens to human society when the future of work is under question of human labor is under question mm. we are not ready for that yeah we're not ready for that and that's that's i think the the scariest part of our governments are so far behind um and so much of so much of 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 this job is now kind of by default left to our collective conscience and yeah i i guess folks like uh, those at open ai yeah there's going to be i think the kind of political and economic impacts are no one's yeah i think people will leave it to act until it's too late not too late but they'll leave it to the last minute <laughs> do you know I'm, they're going to they're going to be like i'm going to deal with it they're like is it a problem today and it's like no and they're like cool cuz i've got like 20 things and like <laughs> going to yeah. wait until like the right time and then they'll be yeah. like okay oh um, so wh- wh- when do you think it's going to become a problem what's the first what's the first point um for you that becomes problematic and where the government feels a need to kind of step in what is it I mean to me like the big picture the like the I mean it's I think it's what you've what you've just alluded to which is like it could kind of in a weird like in the space of like a decade I'm not saying starting today but like mm-hmm. from the first time when it disrupts you know an industry drivers I actually think they're not going to be the first at all but um and people will go oh, who's going to be the first who do you think is going to be first kind of like if you have a job <laughs> if you have a job where like and I include myself in this if you have a job where like you're mostly on your laptop yeah like it's all of those do you know what I mean it's like it, putting ai in charge of like you know several ton vehicles that can oh. kill people is quite like is you know that's going to be low down the list it's like the kind of job that where you go oh i need to like look this up and then i like need to email this guy and then like i mm. need to like work out what to do with this and then i'll slack them and then we'll have a meeting do you think that's already <laughs> happening i think it's going to in terms of low level knowledge jobs as you say not as someone put out like you know you just showed me that demo earlier of of the video uh of that make a video from meta but to me like the more 
impactful one came out last week, which was just they've just taught it to like Google stuff and then like make reports. And like they were like, oh, make a spreadsheet of like all the um, they could just like ask it questions and it would like go and find out the answers and do stuff. And it was using like all the tools that you and I would use to do that. Um, um, so that was kind of, yeah, interesting. Um, and obviously I think it, I think these tools will start out assisting us, right. But at, at which point it will slowly kind of certain companies will start to be like, well, what's the human doing? Um, so it might happen. It will feel like it's happening quite slowly, but I think it could be like a very interesting 10 year period when it goes from. Not you think it's going to happen anything. slowly? I mean, just not that like it won't, it, there's not going to be like AI day three where it's like, no one has a job anymore. Do you know what I mean? It will just become whether it's like outsourcing or, you know, mechanization or the rise of social media, you know, that's been very transformative, but it kind of happened, you know, quickly, kind of quickly over a few years, but there wasn't like a day where there's mm -hmm. like a big, everyone goes, Oh, we need to do something now. It will happen like just slowly enough that, things will start to get more and more weird potentially mm. um, I like that at least this at least this robot loves us that's like a nice <laughs> this is a friend this is a friendly one yes, that's a very seductive thought isn't it that there's safety that the robot cares about us that the yeah. AI does care about us everyone on our side <laughs> rage my friend rage against the machine <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and then, of course, the like, yeah, I think the other reason people have rebelled about, against some of these tools, which I'm not unsympathetic to, is previously, you know, people really did think it was, you know, well, like you say, cleaning the toilet and, you know, hauling cargo long distances and all these kind of slightly, uh, you know, laborious jobs, either domestic or professional. Hmm. that it would disrupt and then there was this kind of utopian counterpoint which was well they'll do all the work we'll have a nice time we'll fix capitalism so that we can still buy stuff and you know we'll yeah, be able to like, do you things know, like like yeah, create you art know, it just it just and i think that's just such a seductive promise right to say yeah. like where and i'm a huge fan of elon musk and and tesla and at least so far um the transparency and accountability with which they're they seem to be operating um with mm. and it's it's that promise is so seductive that oh robots are just going to do um everything that's boring or repetitive or dangerous and then yeah. that'll give you more time to be yourself and explore more intellectual pursuits or creative pursuits but it's i mean nobody's talking about the future of work and Everything that's boring or repetitive or dangerous, almost all of that is currently by, being done by a human being. Mm. And almost all of that is now going to be done by a robot. I mean, you've already seen robots replace humans on the factory floor, on factory floors and on, um, along production lines and factories. What happens to it? I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's great to say that, look, um, it's going to free up so uh, so much of our daily lives um, mm -hmm. to allow us to kind of evolve or, or seek to evolve by following something like if you only, always wanted to learn to play a guitar or learn the piano or mm -hmm. learn to sing or draw well yeah. now you have time for it mm -hmm. but that's kind of presuming that you want to do it yeah yeah and the, and the human you condition didn't quite enjoy your job yeah yeah the human condition yeah is not is not prone to to labor um, yeah. if, especially intellectual labor yeah yeah you know and then what yeah. what is is it and you spoke of 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 evolving capitalism so what does it mean does it mean that we move to something like a universal basic income what is it it's just it's being sold i feel as a promise of utopia Oh, there's going to be it's going there's going to be a problem of plenty, and you'll have to move to universal basic income. 
Yeah. Just, I don't know, it just seems too utopian. It's just too good to be true. I think, I mean, I, I don't disagree. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, but it's kind of, yeah, there's like, the, there's that outcome or the like the mass unemployment one or the one where it just doesn't happen for some reason. And we're, over, we're overestimate, massively overestimating how powerful these tools can become. It hits a kind of ceiling. Um, how pow- I suppose how... I, I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with, with using the word can. Mm. I think it's more of a question of when, not will they become. Yeah. Would you say? Would you say you agree? Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Um, and I think our last kind of... I feel like we've jumped a, a lot, a, quite a long way in the future, but I mean, it's interesting that like there's certain. How, things... Okay, how long? How how far away do you think this is? Ten years. Mm, if you're lucky. I think. Uh, I think if you're born today, I think if you if you then it's going to happen in your lifetime. If you were like, if you're you know a kid that's born today, we'll probably see like the nature of like what is and isn't work um changed quite like dramatically as a result of these forces as long as humanity you know continues on its current path <laughs> um so yeah in the next in the next like definitely like again it will happen i think you know one one of the things i wanted to touch on is like i think we had this uh that sense you say if oh we're gonna like learn the guitar or whatever but it might actually be that like some some kinds of labor and some kind of jobs um might not really lend themselves to this process like i mean if you have an ai as nvidia demonstrated that can already compose music then maybe we won't even want to do that (laughs) just like (laughs) hang out um (laughs) But yeah, our like <laughs> physical selves will remain. It's actually not our brains that because. And so that's where we like, stop evolving. We like because we do nothing. Will, we don't think. Yeah. We don't work. We just, we just become a couch. Do? Yeah, what's no. a robot? Do everything. I, I hope not. I hope not. Um, <laughs> and we've gone into a really dystopian. We've direction. gone right down the rabbit hole, straight to the Warren, my friend. Yeah. We're now in the Warren. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah yeah but no I mean look I think my personal take is um, just given what I see with the rate of development of sheer computational power and the rate at which AI is learning and we're now we're now well into, I mean, if nine-year-olds like my daughter are playing around with um, Dali Mini, then we are well into the cycle of um, training robots, interacting, I mean, training AI, sorry, interacting with them, and that feedback loop is on, right? And the more you give, the, the more the feedback loop works, the smarter the AI becomes, the more you interact with it. And then it's just endless right it kind of exponentially or an exponential rate of growth um and that's what's scary to me and i don't think i don't think if it, if there's a child born today by the time they attain um the age of being able to be employed legally i think it's going to be a lot sooner than that and my very real personal fear is when my nine-year-old daughter grows up and is out of college and what does she go to college to study what is it because you go to college the vast majority of us uh, go in for higher education so that we can get into a certain field of work or expertise so what yeah. do you then study and, and what do you AI. Use... <laughs> <laughs> do you think we need to study that <laughs> uh, ask the AI, or ask the AI what it would be helpful for you to learn so that it's on your side. Um, I don't know, man. It just no, brings us. That's a lovely segue to to this whole point that I wanted to talk to you about about the no code movement mm. and the low code and no code movement. So just think about the times when 
when graphic graphic user interface when it first evolved right and yeah. you can just click somewhere on a screen and then interact with it and magic would happen on your screen and now put that on superimpose the ai's ability onto that what does it do to i mean if you want to study ai and the ai can kind of write code for you better than you ever could yeah what do you study <laughs> what you... yeah and what does it mean i mean is it is it a good thing or a bad thing i mean I... <laughs> the consequences are like no and the first and the second and the... i mean because there's a, there is another argument right which is um uh you know i think we we kind of have similar you know professional whatever kind of concepts of ourselves and and whereas a lot of the illustrators and stuff don't like dally and i'm like well um i think it's cool so i like i like the fact that i can make pictures now so i'm sure it'll be fine but i'm a bit more like Whereas this, whereas if you think about the big picture and the future of work, then as someone with a job, um, you know, that concerns me a bit. But like, let's think about like, not just uh, like the, the threat that it poses to someone like your like your daughter, but also like how it could empower her, right? So she leaves you uh, college um, and let, let's say it, it doesn't matter what she studied, but she, then she has this cool business idea and today, like if that was the case, she might have to like try and raise money for it, like persuade people it was a good idea. She might like face, you know, sexism or something in the VC community to, or, you know, either or she's got to like persuade people to work with her for free, all this kinds of thing. But let's say there's, you know, in 10 years, 15 years from now, there's something out of the box, which is like basically like an intern <laughs> for like uh and so she's got this idea that previously would have taken like four people to do and now she's like okay uh i need you little program i'm going to spend like three days teaching you how to email fashion designers from um south africa or something uh, and then i want you to kind of yeah you're like by three weeks from now i, I need five fashion designers that are willing to work with me on this campaign and now mm. I'm going to get this other other unit so she can have like this little previously now she's got the power to turn this like amazing idea or insight that she's had into something really quickly without needing to kind of go through those things and and, and a bit like how now you can just turn a prompt into a picture she might be able to turn an idea into a business or at least an early prototype business for instance you know, she will have that. She won't just she won't just be like a victim of the tools. She could also be a user of the tools. Now, mm. another it's also the truth that so will everyone else have the tools. So we might just mm. like everything might just start to get really fast because people people go from an idea to like a thing. The product. You know, we'll just all be getting emails from intern AIs like all the time. Like I'd love to collaborate on this, and like because it won't cost people anything to do. So like. Yeah. Obviously, it's hard to just, it's just worth thinking about the counterfactual of like, not just like, will this AI replace me? Um, but how could I you like, will, you know, what value could it provide me? What could I get it to do that today would not be possible or would be out of my reach or only available to people that already have 20 million in, you know, VC funding, you know, I might have that in the same way, mm. this is like more computing power than, mm. you know, people had in them put man on the moon you know we might have more brain power on our laptops than a room of like 20 phds um had and what does that enable us to do it's not clear yet but it's there could mm. be some powerful good things that come out of it but there could also be some really bad ones well it sounds like um well that's interesting you say that because that to me that sounds as if a lot of privilege and how privilege is just defined um gets negated and done away with exactly access so to unleash yeah new kinds of things yeah i mean and we all know the talent can come from anywhere in the world well that's okay. thank you for I've cheering almost... me up oh, okay. <laughs>
You're welcome. No promises, <laughs> but you're welcome. <laughs> All right. I just um, the, I want to talk to you about the um, the Turing test, mm. and um, I think it's an important subject to deal with. Um, essentially, for the Turing test is a test to see um, to monitor human computer interaction and to see if a human can figure out whether it's a it's a computer at the other end that's interacting with him or her uh, in essence yeah. um, but I mean it just it just got me thinking the um, the case with the Google sentient bot it's just so it seems to me it's it's very humans are gullible yeah it doesn't take a lot to fool a human. Oh, no. So do we need a new benchmark for the Turing test? Or is the, is the Turing test outdated and completely and we need something new? Well, I think, I guess at the point, the reason why people, um, why the idea, right, it came when was it 1950? Yeah, I mean. Um, Alan Turing invented the test. And actually, yeah. for a long, we're only talking about, oh, it's easy to fool people. But until maybe like 10 years ago, um, computers were nowhere near, like nowhere near good enough. Like not sure. even, not even remote, like it would take you like, you know, to, uh, to like five minutes to like be like, this is definitely not a real human. Like it's just mm. talking in circles. You remember like I don't know if you ever like played with like a chatbot that was online yeah. back in the yeah. day when they were yeah. and they yeah, and it was fun, but there was no question that you could, you know, sure. um yeah. figure it out. So the fact that we're now like, oh, it doesn't really count and how hard can it be anyway? And like we should get a new one implies that um implies actually that computers are getting pretty smart. Now does it mean they're conscious? No. But um but i don't is it is does the turing is it is the turing test about whether it's conscious no or sentient i think, I think it's interesting or, i mean i mean if trust me i i, I feel if a, if a if a computer or a software program is sentient then it's definitely far more intelligent than the vast majority of humans yeah um, so I think the question is whether, not whether it's sentient or not, but whether it's evolved to a level where sufficient enough for it to just fool the majority of humans interacting with it. And so they're in yeah. the need for a new benchmark. Well, I mean, but what would the, what, what, well, I turn that back to you, what would you think the new benchmark would be? I don't know. I guess it depends on the human that, the, that it's interacting with. Don't you think? What give it smarter people to, to, to drink? <laughs> I guess throw our smartest mm. minds at it and see if it succeeds. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the current I feel like what with things like GPT three and uh I mean actually Meta put out an extremely bad chatbot the other day. I don't know if you saw it, Blender three, which was Oh yeah said a lot of bad things in a short <laughs> space of time i think <laughs> maybe that's the new test the new test is like can you put it online <laughs> well they did didn't they they had to pull it off someone, without someone getting it to say something absolutely dire um because that <laughs> that was a real mess um so there's obviously still some work to do but to me that is a huge milestone i mean they don't they seem to have stopped doing i think they used to kind of have these like yearly comp like cheering test competitions but for some reason um they they don't they, so i mean it would be i feel like someone should be able to if it's not happened yet i'm kind of surprised i would imagine in the next year or two it would be fairly easy um not easy as a result of a lot of research but yeah like a lot of the, if like when you start thinking of looking at the things that exist in ai more generally this seems yeah. like it would be a possible problem um a test that could soon be passed and then what mm -hmm. new test we create beyond that i'm um i'm not sure <laughs> yeah 
No, yeah, I agree. I think it's very, very, it's it's a very real um, stage in the evolution of of AI mm -hmm. and the path that it's currently on. I don't think there's it's very long before it reaches a point where I think it's sufficient to sufficiently uh, advanced enough to pass a Turing test. But I think for me, the bigger threat is when you put all of this together, robotics and computer vision and machine learning, and then you have singularity. Yeah. And for me, that's... I don't want to be alive then. Mm. Well, that is, I do think before that, though, it might just like life might just get weirdly fast. I'm just still thinking about the era where like, you know, your daughter can like start her project or company, but then like literally a day later, someone can see it and do kind of the same thing and just everything can just move almost like a, in the same way that like rather than have to paint a picture for a whole day, hmm. you know, I can now generate an, an in like, seconds. Images in seconds like how does that all start to like do you know what i mean everything can just as we sort of automate various things and they become quicker and faster so that yeah. my cat is obsessed with sitting on me um <laughs> my cat is neither artificial nor intelligent um <laughs> <laughs> yes you're on a podcast there we go um, then, then um <laughs> I was going to say, you're a nuisance. Um, no. <laughs> then, yeah, then, then, you know, it's kind of, uh, there's a term, isn't it? I forget what it is, but, you know, what makes creativity and sort of labour kind of meaningful is like the friction. You know, mm. that's what makes a, a statue made of different materials have a different effect because of the kind of the nature of the material. And as sort mm. of, as we remove the friction from everything and it becomes faster and faster and smoother and smoother and dumb porous and like... What do we kind of grab onto? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. What I'm yeah. yeah. <laughs> it all becomes just like it's almost become like a like a like I think of it as kind of it's like just, a, a a flotation tank, you know, where there's no like sense, where all your senses, sensory deprivation, no, like, and it just yeah, it's just happening too fast for us. to... it's like a yeah, yeah, and then now it's just a blur. But you know, there's also this whole school of thought and a lot of research. And there's another Elon Musk company, by the way, uh, Neuralink, that's looking at um, yeah um, brain implants for augmentation or or repair mm. uh, or restoration of um, neuromuscular functions. Um, and I guess I don't know. It's just I guess part of that is also the next step in our evolution. Um, and there's a lot. Of, I mean, I was listening to. <laughs> I think there'll be. I I don't think they'll run short of test vic, uh, test subjects, test victims, test victims. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say that. You know, you might have a few of them as well. Yeah, for sure. But um, I think there should be enough uh, test subjects. <laughs> there should be enough people who will who who need that technology. Um, sure. Yeah, for the more for medical. Yeah, purposes. yeah, for the more exactly. medical kind. Yeah. Um, and of course, futurists will say, "Oh, you know, we need some, um, we need kind of nanobots in our neurocortex to interface with uh, computers because essentially it's a matter of bandwidth. It's not a matter of computational power or the human brain's ability to evolve. It's a matter of bandwidth and information being shared at a particular bandwidth." So the limiting factor is bandwidth, and if that, I mean, it's just oh, that's another rabbit yeah. hole. <laughs> it really. But, uh, you need that. That's you need to get a new. I think here, your next guest needs to be a, a, a new, <laughs> new, neuroscientist. I think we're getting a bit into me just guessing. I'm like, oh, would I put a wire in my head? Probably not. <laughs> oh yeah, but these are these are things that we're pictures. all. <laughs> I think we should all stop before we get away. <laughs> before we go down another. <laughs> oh man, it's been brilliant talking to you. It's been brilliant talking to you, guy. Uh, it's thank always you so fun much. And a little bit scary to talk about this stuff. So I've yeah, I've enjoyed your points. Your yeah, yeah. Great discussion. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I'll put a link to uh, to Gallery Gallery um, in the comments below. And I hope um, you'll have. Well, a few more of the people who 
<laughs> who are charitable, enough. Readers can't be wrong, <laughs> charitable yeah. enough with their time to watch this uh, this video and to listen in and tune in. But thank you so much. Thank you so much for spending your time uh, talking to me about all of this. Uh, it's Thanks been so fascinating. Much for me. Yeah, great. All right. Uh, bye, and, bye, uh, <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> all right. And I'll just for uh, our viewers, uh, those who are tuning in, uh, watching this. So don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, feel free to post your comments below. Uh, over the horizon is uh, where we're at. I'd love to hear from you. Keep all your comments coming. And thank you again, Guy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much again. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Bye-bye now.